to hear from our very own now Bustamante this evening. <laughs> curatorial practices in the public sphere program. And um, I wanted to let you all know about the upcoming talks. Next week, February 8th, we will have our distinguished MA alumni and curator at the Vincent Price Museum, Joseph Valencia, speaking. And following that, on February 13th, um, presented at LAX Art, uh, will be Josh Klein, artist in town. Um, check out our events page for more upcoming Rossi Talks. And now, without further ado, I will hand it off to our wonderful MA and MFA students, um, Bryce and Emily. We'll introduce them. Hi, can everybody hear me? Um, welcome to tonight's Rossi Talk. We are very honored to introduce you, or introduce to you now. Uh, my name is Bryce. I'm a first year MA here at USC Rossi. So I'm going to read a short bio uh, to form the introduce now. Now Bustamante is an internationally known artist, originally from California. She now resides in Los Angeles. Bustamante's precarious work encompasses performance art, video installation, visual art, filmmaking, and writing. Bustamante has presented in galleries, museums, universities, and underground sites all around the world. She has exhibited, among other locales, at the Institute of Contemporary Art in London, the New York Museum of Modern Art, the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, and Sundance International Film Festival. Bustamante is an alum of the San Francisco Art Institute, New Genres Program, and the Skopagan School of Painting and Sculpture. Currently, she holds the position of Associate Professor and Vice Dean of Art at the USC Rossi. Oh, that's an old bio. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, hey, hey, I went to your website, okay? <laughs> like I said, it's an old bio. <laughs> we'll share the blame, okay? Um, at this time, we would like to invite Nala to the stage. Please give her a warm welcome. Okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Great to see you all. Um, yeah, so ooh, now I'm a professor, not associate professor. And, um, I'm not vice dean of art. <laughs> So, but um, yeah, I'm, I also I'm not a web artist, so there you have it. The <laughs> website is not updated, um, as it were. Uh, I'm just going to start by playing the video, and then we'll, we'll keep talking.
well, that goes on for about eight minutes, so <laughs> we'll stop it there. It's from a work called Neapolitan. <clears throat> and he, just watching it actually makes me emotional. It's the idea of sort of um, the space of media where media is inside of you and the narrative is reflected back on top of you. So, you know, how, how many of you have ever cried watching a movie or something along those lines? Yeah, several of you, okay, great. So, um, you know, sometimes people will just watch a movie because they want to cry, right? Like they'll want to get in touch with some aspect of, emotional aspect of themselves. Um, I'm the worst because I'm completely seduced. I'm an easy target. I'll cry like a McDonald's commercial about single dads, like <laughs> waterworks, you know. So it kind of frustrated me feeling so vulnerable to media makers, to, to, to storytellers. And I thought, well, maybe if I just rewatch the end of a movie over and over and just cry as much as I can, that I could, in fact, sort of rid myself of that vulnerability. And it's one of those projects, I call them bur brain burrs. It, you know, burrs are like little seeds that get stuck in your socks and your dog and stuff when you walk in the weeds. So brain burrs are ideas that won't go away. And oftentimes the way that I work is I'll have an idea, it's like a flash of an idea. Sometimes it's an image, sometimes it's a specific idea. And um, I don't necessarily do anything about it. I don't write it down, I don't try to track it. It's just an idea that keeps coming back around and I can't get rid of it. And then I have to do it in order to get rid of it. So this is one of those ideas. It's called Neapolitan. I'm basically watching the end of a movie called, uh, it's, a, it's a very famous um, Cuban film called Fresa y Chocolate by um, the, the filmmaker Gutierrez, seminal film. And at the end of the movie, the characters hug, and one of them says, I love you. And that's pretty much it, and the music swells. You know, it's a classic swelling. <laughs> You know, and, um, and it just, it's this trigger that happens, and I think about it like an emotional vibrator. <laughs> and so I was trying to figure out how to install this video idea. Well, first I was trying to think of a better or different film to do it with, but I couldn't think of one. So I just went with the film that gave me the idea. And then I started thinking about installing it. Installing video is quite can be quite challenging. And at the same time, so we have this kind of brain burr, we have a kind of opportunities, and we have what's happening in your life at the time, right? So for me, I was trying to minimize that, the, the, the television set in my living room. So I was like, put, a, put a, a scarf on it, and then I put a plant on it, and then I put a photo on it, and then pretty soon I had my grandmother's living room <laughs> and so I started thinking about this kind of feminist fiber arts on steroids kind of installation for this work, kind of goopy, over emotional. And so, um, so this is the installation. Um, and when a viewer sits in the um, in the space, they are tethered by these headphones. This this, this one is the first one's your point. Of this one is at the bro. And they become sort of part of the installation, right? To watch the vid video, part of what you just saw excerpt. Um, oh my God, I just, I just realized I forgot to thank my hosts. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> this is really embarrassing. Sorry, you guys. Um, thank you for the invitation, Jennifer. And <laughs> thank you for the invitation, Jenny. I'm very excited to be here. I really appreciate it, and I'm really excited to talk with people tomorrow, and uh, thank you for the pe to the people who are on the hiring committee um, <laughs> in uh, 2016 who brought me here. I really, really appreciate it. Um, 
Oh God, actually, you know, it's like this whole thing where we're kind of in this, like, you know, still in this COVID zone, right? And uh, I don't know, I, coming back here is a little bit triggering for me. <laughs> so I'm having some, I'm having some feelings. Come on in, come on in. I was just talking about how being back here is triggering. <laughs> uh, and, um, you know, I, I promised myself I wasn't going to become emotional today during this talk. And, I'm sorry. I, uh, <clears throat> you can usually tell s someone is being sincere when they, <clears throat> when they, thank you. <laughs> it's, it's, that thank you, that's wonderful, it's, um, there's, there's a part of me, um, Oh, I love you too. Uh, see how bad, <laughs> how sucky I am. I, uh, yeah, but there's this thing <coughs> that happens when people clear their throat, mm -hmm. which makes them seem really sincere. And sometimes if you leave like space between words, that can also really make somebody seem sincere about what they're saying. <laughs> but you cannot know how I feel coming back here. You can't. You can't know how I'm feeling right now unless you let me hypnotize you. <laughs> Are you ready <laughs> to be hypnotized? Uh, yes. Okay, get ready. Everyone, both feet on the floor, across your arms and legs, loosen your neck, shoulders back, soften your gaze, <sighs> Let's do three deep breaths. Soften your gaze or close your eyes. And I want you just to feel the top of your head relaxing. And the forehead relaxing, the nose, the bridge of the nose, the lips, the throat relaxing, the shoulders relaxing, back and down, your heart relaxing, your internal organs relaxing, your tailbone relaxing, your sex relaxing, your buttocks relaxing, your large thigh muscles relaxing, your knees relaxing, your shins relaxing, your calves relaxing, your ankles relaxing, your feet relaxing. Now in your mind's eye, I want you to see a large balloon of any color, bright colored balloon. And I want you to place in that balloon all the worries that you have. Worries that are about finances, family, friends, work, art, relationships. Did I say money? Money again, <laughs> COVID. And I want you to, in your mind's eye, take that balloon out of the building and let it go into the night sky. And you watch the balloon get smaller and smaller and smaller still until it disappears into the night sky. And all of those worries and concerns are now out in the world, making work, doing your bidding. I want you to see one more balloon. 
and that balloon is any color you want, a bright color. And in that balloon, I want you to put all your hopes and dreams and desires and fantasies. And again, walk the balloon out to the building, out of the building, let it go into the night sky, sky. Watch it get smaller and smaller and smaller. Watch it disappear. And now all of those desires, dreams, hopes, and fantasies are out doing your bidding. They are out working for you in the world. With your eyes closed, I want you to imagine how you just saw me up here. I want you to project onto me what you think my concerns are, what my dreams are, what my hopes are. You come closer to me and I give you a big hug. And you notice this small zipper right where the hairline meets my forehead. And I unzip myself all the way down my body and my skin just falls off like a big suit and you step in to my skin suit and you pull it up your legs and you put your hands in my hands and you pull it up like a hoodie my head over your head and you zip yourself into my skin. My hopes are your hopes. My dreams are your dreams. My desires are your desires. On the count of three, you will become me. One, two, three, you are me. Okay, we can open our eyes. So that is a hypnosis from a work called Find Yourself Through Me, in which I hypnotize people to be me. And at the point of becoming me, I take a photo of them, and I place it inside of this growing portrait of me's. And so in some ways, you know, this is, of course, like the most solipsistic, you know, ego-driven, performance piece ever, and I'll go with that. Um, and it was born out of the idea of not really seeing myself reflected back to me. And so I kind of have a knack or talent for doing the most obvious thing. And so that's, that's this work, Find Yourself Through Me. But it's also, over the years, I've also done several projects where I we'll bring together community for different projects. Um, like this is a, a cast photo from the work that was just uh, premiered at Red Cat. You might recognize a couple people in there. And um, it was called The Wooden People and it's primarily a VR project and it's, we did some live reenactment of some of the scenes but we haven't actually released it yet um, in VR. If we have time maybe I'll show a little clip or trailer of that. This is not my work, but this is how I think of my work. I don't think of my work as a linear space. One project leads to the next project to the next project. I think about my work more like a crazy quilt stitched together, you know, of little fragments and pieces of things that I've picked up along the way of, my, of the past and uh, kind of embellishments and each performance I do, or each video I do, or each thing that I write, or anything I, I produce, it's, it belongs in a kind of material space that I can reuse, re-envision, remake, restructure. Um, this is a photo I recently added to <laughs> my slideshow. This is the first time I did something that I would consider performance art. I was going to Fresno State. That's my mom and my niece. And I was uh, doing some abstract dance to Meat Puppets, this um, song, this group. And um, it was very abstract. And I was, at the time, I was an economics major um, with a minor in pre-law. 
and I was really bored. <laughs> and so I started taking these dance classes. The dance classes led me to San Francisco where I was really engaged in a variety of performances and I'm very much part of a nightclub scene, a drag scene, queer world, um, uh, kind of the, the beginning of thinking through ideas around um, trans and, and queer folks. And um, we didn't have the word trans then, as it turns out. This is a, a character that I was doing, um, this is 1992. This is a character named Rosa. And um, 1992 was the anniversary of the discovery of the Americas, right? So a lot of artists, especially artists of color, were encouraged to do work around that. And so I did a piece where I strapped on a burrito and I invited white men to come from the audience and take a bite of my burrito to absolve themselves of 500 years of repression of guilt. <laughs> and of course, it was a real hoot, you know, everyone was offended. It was great. And um, later I ended up making a really bad um, wax statue of myself doing that work. Um, the same year I went on the Joan River show as the same character, Rosa. And um, I was there as an exhibitionist. Um, and I, I'm not officially an exhibitionist. I am performance artist um, at this time, and um, I told them that I was uh, kind of more of a stunt exhibitionist, and I would dress up for exhibitionism and go out and do like particular stunts. So when I went on this show, we thought about how we could use this opportunity, me and, me and some friends, and so I had this friend I was supporting at the time named Stafford, who was going through a transition of being female to male. And so we decided um, that I would tell some outlandish stories about exhibitionism. And in particular, I would bring up somebody I'd met who was a multi-gendered multi and a sexual person. And we were you know, really struggling to find language that you know, to kind of open things up and to make sense. And our idea was that it was going to be somewhat of a kernel into the mainstream, like a seed into the mainstream, an intervention into a mainstream world. So I'm going to show you um, a video that I made, um, which was my first video art piece. And the video is me on the Joe Murray show. Okay. Oh yeah, we gotta lower that. This is a kind of a bright sounding video. So um, the other thing I wanted to say before we show this is if anyone has a question or comment, please just interrupt me. Um, what is a good way to interrupt somebody while they're speaking? Does anyone have thoughts about that? Any good ways to intervene if you want to ask a question? Raise your hand. Raise your hand, that's great. Did you have a question? No, I was just going to say raise your hand. <laughs> <laughs> oh, perfect. Yeah, what's another good way besides raising your hand? Just stand up and start speaking. Just start speaking, yes. <laughs> yeah, great. Okay, so we'll watch this video and then if people have questions or comments, we can, uh, we can go into it.
How many of you up front would turn away if you saw a couple right in the window making love?
best friend. Oh, really? Yeah. She told me that I that in my manners and the way I looked at everything that I reminded her of her best friend. You know, and I don't know why she didn't just invite me out to lunch right then and there. <laughs> Logistically, is how did I find myself on the show, etc. That kind of thing. Um, remember, we were talking about sort of life opportunity, meeting sort of where you're at, right, um, with your practice. So at the time, I was um, working at a at a store called Good Vibrations, a women-owned sex toy cooperative that was um, in San Francisco. Um, it's still there, but I don't think it's a cooperative anymore. And um, I worked with a woman named Carol Queen, who is a professional exhibitionist. She, I think she got a PhD in exhibitionism or something. She wrote a book called Exhibitionism for the Shy. She was officially <laughs> an exhibitionist. And they called her to be on the show. She couldn't do it. So knowing you know, that I'm a performer, she said, hey, do you, are you interested in this opportunity? We'll bring you to New York. And so I said, sure. So I called them up. She gave me the number. I called them up. And um, they said, OK, this is, this is alarming to see, to see how these things kind of happen in a way, because it's sort of the, the way that media is built on you know, kind of like toothpicks. So um, the producer said, how do you know you're an exhibitionist? I said, I can, uh, if I'm on a bus, if I think somebody's looking at my ass, I can squeeze my legs together and have an orgasm. <laughs> and he said, okay, great. Let's, <laughs> let's get you on the show. <laughs> and that's literally what happened. And um, so I went there. I told them that I was uh, an exhibitionist who just dressed, you know, like that was a kink, but it wasn't my daily, I had an alter ego, so I told them I had this persona named Rosa, and they were like, great, and then um, the way these shows work, the producers ask you a bunch of questions, and they make notes, and they kind of cap encapsulate it for the host, so the host knows what you're going to talk about before you talk about it, but they, I didn't tell them the part about the multigender and the sexual bit, I told them about the aquarium, I told them about being in your, I told them all these stories, but then I didn't tell them that one little bit, that kernel. So it was really, I love seeing this Jones reaction when I say a multi-gendered ambisexual at an aquarium, and she looks and says, an aquarium? You know, like she's <laughs> trying to process what I've just said to her, right? But she was really a dear, and it was, and I, it kind of occurred to me while showing this video that probably a lot of you don't know who Joan Rivers is, because you know, uh, generationally, 
she was this very, very well-known um, female comedian that was like paved the way for uh, a lot of female comedians. And um, she would be, I don't know, maybe equivalent to, what's another late night? She did daytime talk shows. So anyway, it was like a well-known daytime talk show. And um, I was always super freaked out that someone from my family would see this. <laughs> Which is a theme in my life. <laughs> but, um, Did anyone ever see it after? I don't know. <laughs> to be honest, I don't know. I think a lot of times my family tends to, um, I, I don't know. They, I, they, they, they have seen some of my work. They, have, they don't know kind of all of my work, but you know, it's the internet. Like, I'm sure, so, I'm sure some of my family have Googled me and just are too polite to mention it. <laughs> um, <laughs> anyway, we're gonna just, uh, I'm gonna move us really quickly through some different vibes because we are so far from the present moment. Um, so this is an image from uh, America the Beautiful. And a lot of my work previously, really performances had to do with kind of like probing female image and um, making myself vulnerable. Um, also kind of making myself, this is, uh, uh, kind of use, reusing some of those materials from America the Beautiful tape, shadow play, um, but also adding different elements. This is uh, a work called Given Over to Want, where I sort of take this bag of wine on my head after doing some shadow play and I put a, plunge a knife through the box and then sort of run around trying to drink the wine. And um, it turns, it's very, it's a kind of a very heavy, animalistic um, kind of performance. Here's a work called Now's Under the Rug, where I lay under a rug for 45 minutes with a microphone and kind of just respond to things going around, going on around me. Um, this is a work called Sun Gravity, where I'm uh, taping a bag of water on my head. Kind of an endurance work, short endurance, but endurance, nonetheless. And um, I think also with this work, I'm very interested in the kind of projection qualities of the face and the bag and the distortions. And, um, and this work really illustrated to me very much how work changes meaning throughout time, you know, as, as it kind of moves through time. So when I first did this work, I was imagining a kind of uh, peaceful precariousness, this idea of my head inside of another head. The idea of what, because you know, our bodies are so much water, what if I could put my head in another head? Well, that insulation, what would that feel like? Um, but then when I, you know, down the road, people sort of saw it more about waterboarding or some kind of torturous act or, um, but um, it wasn't occurring to me at the time, although later I did do a work called Deathbed. Um, I've been exploring death my whole life. I'm about to embark on another work um, about my death. And um, I think, you know, a lot of us, when we're younger, maybe we have someone important in our lives pass away, and we, whether it's a human or a dog, and we sort of start mulling that over. And you often hear about people, you know, kids who are sort of obsessed with death. Like I was one of those kids that were obsessed with death. And um, at one point in my adult life, I went to see uh, Celia Cruz laying in state, and she was like the queen of salsa, really, really important musician in um, a kind of Latin American landscape and, and, and otherwise. But, there were no photos allowed. I've never been able to find a photo of her since, but she was so incredibly beautiful. Like I waited in line to see her. It was in, it was in Manhattan. And she was laying in this like cream coffin with like cream colored hair and nails. And um, 
the whole the whole scene was really incredible. And a couple of years later, I um, I was uh, going to be on this um, again playing with uh, mainstream media on a show called Work of Art, America's Next Great Artist. And for that show, for auditioning tape, we had to make a piece of work. So I had been thinking about this idea, one of those brain birds that wouldn't go away. How would I want to be found if dead? Like, what's my fantasy of how I'd want to be found? <laughs> and so I sort of put this scene together. And um, I was trying to kind of create this space between, like, a la like I was trying to theatrically portray a kind of space of like last breath, right? Or last thought, or like exiting the body kind of thing. And um, I thought this was the best of the of the photos we took. And but the practice of trying to get the photo made me really think that that was kind of maybe more interesting. So I later restaged the photo as a performance. And so when the person comes in they, to the gallery, they see me sort of gasping or trying to create this sort of last breath moment. And when they come around, there's a video camera pointed to me, and the set is sort of cut out. Like it's a phot photograph of the set. or it's, a, it's my photograph, and then I'm cut out, and then live I'm sort of placed in relationship to the video camera and the, and the photograph. Um, oddly, on on the work of art, um, this TV show, the first the first um, challenge was a portrait challenge, and the guy who got me, he actually drew me dead. That or he still drew me dead, and he didn't know about this other work. So it was kind of an eerie, co inky dink. This is the cast from that show. This was my catchphrase. I'm not responsible for your experience of my work. This was the lo this was the piece that I got kicked off for. <laughs> um, <laughs> it was the shock episode, and I was dying to leave. Oh my god, I was so stressed out. I, I it was like the show pushed me into menopause. I had I had my period for like eight weeks while we were shooting. I just couldn't stop bleeding. I was so stressed out. And um, I had a show to do in Berlin, and I needed to leave the show. And I was just like, oh my god, get me off of the show. I developed plantar fasciitis when I was on the show. So I was like in this anemic state, foot pain, surrounded by people I didn't like, <laughs> trying to make art by them taking me to Utrecht and giving me $100. The person who doesn't write down anything for six years and then makes art. I was like so stressed out. So I made this piece um, trying to get kicked off the show. And um, I ended up really liking the work. <laughs> Personally, I kind of made this costume from the sponsor bags you track. And um, I had heard, I had a painting lesson just before I went on the show. And, the main takeaway was never mix colors until you have brown because nobody likes a brown painting. So I sort of put all these colors into a bag and I was like stroking and squeezing the paint. It was like creating this thing that, that Jerry Saltz, who was one of the judges, called a shit flower. <laughs> um, anyway, so having been, uh, you know, I kind of, this was a moment where I kind of came into the mainstream a little bit, popped my head up, whack-a-mole got knocked down, and had some really, also some really touching experiences with people. This was one of my favorite <laughs> fan letters from a young girl um, who had never seen this interesting style of art that I was making. But then I also had, there was also some interest, other interesting um, sort of trolling works. Um, granted, when I went on the show, I was playing a meaner version of myself, and um, I was trying to use the show as a, as a work of art itself, right? Using the apparatus to, to actually do things I didn't know how to do, and to express sort of more of a state of, uh, of uh, creative confusion. Um, but um, so when I was in the process of the show airing and I was getting some good, good things, good feedback, and then also I was getting 
these weird kind of trolling experiences, I started imagining this um, talisman of a dress, a dress that could protect me, that would go all the way up to my neck, go all the way down to my hands, and go all the way down the floor, made of Kevlar. And I started sort of imagining this super costume just to protect me from trolls, <laughs> protect my heart. And um, about that time, I got invited to do a show called From Chewbacca to Zapata, Re Reenvisioning the Myth of the Mexican Revolution. One of the curators is here tonight, Marcus Kula Nazario, my dear, my dear brother, collaborator. And um, anyway, so I started looking into the Mexican Revolution a bit more, and I found that there were these brigades of women fighters and they looked like they were wearing these dresses that I had been that had been in my mind um, for the you know for the last couple of weeks, and so we kind of return to that theme of circumstances meeting opportunity, right? And um, so I ended up making um, an Edwardian fighting costume that was a kind of memorial time traveling for these women who fought in the Mexican Revolution and displaying that in the group show. Um, I then tested it against weapons from the era. Um, this is a historic gun, um, something, a rifle that was very much uh, commonly used in the Mexican Revolution. And um, here's the dress that's uh, displayed now, more as a fallen soldier. It has some slugs embedded in the apron bin of the Kevlar, but Kevlar the material itself is, is such such an interesting material, such interesting properties, invented by a woman scientist for DuPont. And the, and the material stops things not because of its thickness, like steel or, or lead or something like that. It stops things because of the weave. And the weave is so intricate back and forth on itself that when a bullet hits it or some other projectile hits it, it disperses the energy into the fabric. So it's kind of like all of those little threads, they, they, they take an impact and disperse it through the material. So it's really like a use once kind of thing. <laughs> you know, if you get, if you get in an accident or get shot or get knifed or whatever, that's kind of what they mostly make it for. Um, it's a, it's a one-time deal. But it really sent me on this um, journey of uh, doing a larger scale work called Silva Vera. And so I really got into researching at the special collections at UC Riverside. And it was the most well-documented war in history. It was the advent of the, of the, of the um, still camera. And there were so many images, but there were hardly any images of women. I mean, there, it was, I don't know, maybe in the neighborhood of 5% of the, I looked, probably looked at 20,000 photos something like that. And there weren't a lot of first-hand accounts because, of course, the war, part of its uh, ethos was to fight for literacy. So a lot of people who were fighting were illiterate and were not able to write first-hand accounts. But when I would find a photo, it would really, it would really speak to me. It would really, like, kind of reach out of time and grab me, right? So this is a scene of women who were going alongside the different brigades, the fighting brigades, and they would, uh, they did everything. They were nurses, they were comfort women, they were wives, they bore children, they cooked meals. Some of them fought, some of them um, led brigades, some of them stayed home, and they took care of their own villages and towns. And it was a war that lasted um, 10 years. This is one of my favorite images. I just love that vanishing point, right? The, the drawers and painters and other people in here, I think, can really appreciate this crazy photo. And the, the kind of textures and the distances and the, and the intensity in the eyes of these women. Um, I ended up finding a script by this Russian filmmaker um, Sergei Eisenstein, maybe some of you are familiar. He's a really seminal figure if you ever study um, film or video. He was, he was the guy who made um, 
like the the edit, right? Like what, I don't remember the name of the famous one. October. Yeah, but the but the name of he developed a, a technique. What? Double yeah. yeah. What's it? That, uh, anyway, it's like a kind of, basically, it's like something we use all the time, which is sort of like putting one cut next to another, and it creates a third meaning, right? So, like a beer commercial would be like, beer and boobs equals a great time, or something. You know, like it's, we use it all the time, everyday life. But anyway, he wrote this film. Um, and if you could find it on YouTube in an edited form that wasn't his original final edit, but it's called Que Viva Mexico. There was a section he never finished called Soldadera. So I took that script and I, re, uh, I reworked the script and I used, the, uh, I used photos um, as backdrops from the uh, archive and I had the actors in the Kevlar dresses sort of reenacting the script. It all, this also led me to meeting the oldest woman in the world at the time. Uh, Senora Leandra Becerra Lumbreras. She was the last survivor of the Mexican Revolution. And I met her in Zapopan, uh, near Guadalajara, and it was absolutely an amazing experience. I ended up taking video of her and placing her in this kind of um, goof on VR, I guess you could say. It's a stereoscopic viewer from the 18th century and uh, to view stereoscopic photos, but I put like a media player in there with this um, kind of double image. So the video was, was, a bit of a, was a bit of a 3D experience. And then there's these wood headphones and then there's these fresh guavas and uh, when you sit on the when you sit on the stool, the stool has like a booty base in it that um, takes Senora Leandro's clapping and, and puts it in your rump. And the work was called Chacmul. And Chacmul is a Mesoamerican sculpt, a sculpture figure that is um, kind of in that position. You know, you've 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 seen it before um, when you sit down to view to view the video of the sculpture and. Uh, the, the, the figure is, um, it, uh, people aren't exactly sure what the figure represents, but some people say the figure is to meet fallen soldiers and to take them to the other side. So, uh, and it's, it's, the, it's the shape that, um, that Leandra is making there. I'm gonna play a little bit of Leandra's video. For people, I feel like I feel like Leandra blesses all the spaces she inhabits. Um, so, 
we are going to be wrapping it up quite soon. I'm going to just whiz you through this current project, which I'm, I'm doing more research on, which is I'm in the process of redesigning the speculum. Um, speculum is a medical instrument that's primarily used for exam pelvic examination. And actually just had one yesterday. <laughs> and it was, it's kind of never, it's like, it's still always very shocking for me. I always avoid those. I really do avoid that. But you know, you're supposed to go get your um, examinations and um, and um, you know, for some um, people, it's a really painful, triggering process to have it done. And what I found out from, um, I'm just gonna kind of go through some of these images while I'm talking. What I found out um, through researching some of this is that the, the, spec, the main speculum that's in use now was invented by a, doc, a, 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 a person from the past named Dr. Marion Sims, who was considered the father of gynecology. He practiced on enslaved women in his backyard hospital in South Carolina without anesthesia. And the first speculums that he developed was based on the image of a gravy spoon. And um, so, or not the image, I'm sorry, an actual gravy spoon. Um, so I'm gonna just play a little video. These images you're seeing are from a, um, a, a show that I installed in um, San Antonio at a place called Art Pace, where I had a residency for three months last summer, and I developed a lot of the ideas uh, for Bloom uh, project. But I'm gonna, show, I'm gonna go back into Vimeo and show you a little, a little video. <clears throat> Is it up still? It's funny. Maybe if I escape. I wonder if I closed it after the Joan Rivers experience. Oh, I think it's over here. Dragging it over. So this, um, that's a walkthrough of the show. It's available on ArtPace if anyone wants to go look at it. It's a really great, like, 3D walkthrough. Um, I can send the link out to your profies also. And um, yeah, so I'm gonna just show you, this is a little speculum puppet video I made, it's very short. And it talks about the history of the speculum. And it was uh, part of the exhibition. Sims put it in his half-baked 
practicing it's from the 1800s and it was suspended um, in this space and um, I actually I used it for performance on opening night and um, we'll, we'll be continuing to develop that performance also uh, yes sir I, I love the work it's so surprising the way it takes twists and turns Say again? Why do you think you make art? Oh, that's a really, that's a tough question. Why do I think I make art? Um, I don't have other talents, I guess. Um, I, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I think it first started as a, as a, as a kind of calling, you know? I felt this very much this like, need, really need desire, and uh, actually even the last time I did this, uh, the, the wooden people at Red Cat, after I said, oh, that might be really the last, I mean, I'm like, I'm always like, this is really the last thing I'm going to do. <laughs> I've been saying that since my 20s, so, I don't know. Yes? Oh, thank you so much, that was wonderful. Um, I, you did say why you did the No, there were more. Okay. You were you were just in your own feelings okay. at that point. <laughs> and I was wondering, did that exercise work? You said that you were crying in order to try to like not be so manipulative by the end. Do you feel that you were successful? Yes, I was I was trying to kind of cure myself through art, um, in a way to become less emotional. Um, and I did not cure myself um, in that realm. I think I'm very like, I'm really, but I, as you can see from the lecture, I, I do like play with it more now. Like I can kind of, I know the, I know sort of the indicators of emotionality, I guess you could say now. But um, I do think emotion, emotionality and emotions is hugely important hugely. I'm saying that as a rational person. <laughs> as somebody who depends on reason for much of my life, that emotions are hugely, hugely important to our process. Please. Yeah, I, as you know, I've always done fast women, body work, the way that you take on the new And now 
Yeah, I, you know, I was thinking it's really difficult to sort of track my work because I think for a while I've been, like in terms of giving a lecture, artist talk or whatever you want to call it, because I, I think times I've tracked it from being like body vulnerable to body protected to body entered, you know, like always about the body. But then I could track it via media and, and genre also. Um, I, I have a ton of, of uh, videos, short films, and th things that I did not show you. Um, but uh, yeah, you can only get so much in. But I think with the, I think with the 360 stuff um, and the and the VR stuff, I was really interested in it because I love backstage. I love behind the scenes. I love the other side of the camera as much as front of the camera. So I was kind of imagining being able to work in that space would be kind of like collapsing backstage and front stage. It wasn't exactly like that. Um, there were some moments, but it was, um, it, again, it's, it was very new to me as a medium and I, you know, it's like either the first piece I'm gonna make in VR or the last piece I'm gonna make in <laughs> VR. I really haven't decided yet, but thank you. Any, anyone yeah, else? Do you want to play a little bit of that? Oh, okay, we have another, we have another um, uh, hand up back here. Can you ask if you can speak more to the next steps of the special design project and where you're hoping that to land? Like, if it's broader than an artistic space, if it's, if you're hoping for it to have another level? Can I, I'm sorry, could someone, re can you repeat or could someone else repeat the question? Because I couldn't quite. I can speak louder. Okay. Um, I was wondering if you could more about the direction of the Speculum project moving forward and where you're hoping, in what fields you're hoping for that project to land and make an impact? In a particular work or in my... She's talking about the Speculum project? Oh, the Speculum She's project. She's asking oh. if um, oh. you had um, places you wanted it to go beyond maybe art into oh, the yeah. real world. Yeah, I'm trying, to, I'm, I'm working on a prototype now. Um, and I'm working on a patent um, of the of the, and I'm trying to work with, get into some collaborative with material scientists about, and you know I think um, I I I'm not sure you know it's a really tricky space to try to inhabit, um, but um, I am encouraged by the feedback that I get. Um, particularly from people who have undergone pelvic examinations. Whenever I say I'm redesigning the speculum, I'm usually, through, oh, thank God. You know, it's usually the response, oh, thank you for trying. Because, um, you know, I think maybe if it, if it, if, I don't really know how far I'll be able to take it, but I have, uh, because I'm an artist, you know, a lot of work has gotten spun out from that idea. And it's so interesting to think about the script of the pelvic examination. Because the script, the medical script, was developed in the Victorian era. And there's a, there's a whole there's a whole relationship to the woman disassociating from her pelvic region during, or the person disassociating from their pelvic region during the examination in order to not um, become like sex crazed and attack the doctor, right? Mm -hmm. So it's sort of based on, it's really, you know, yeah, it's like crazy talk when you guys start getting into it. So I've been really interested in the script and, and also other practices of other countries in, in relation to pelvic examination. So um, I think, you know, there's just so much room in there to roam. I suspect this will probably be like a three year project or so. Um, and I produced a ton of work like just in like a three month stretch, but um, but um, now uh, I'm getting into it, so to speak. <laughs> but before we um, before we go any further, I want to turn yourselves all back into yourselves really quick. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so if you could just like let's snap into that sort of alpha state really quickly, both feet on the floor, taking deep breaths in. And out, and in, and out, and in, and out, and I'd like you 
to unzip my skin from yourself, your body. Just take that little zipper zip and zip it all the way down the front of your body and allow my skin to fall off of you. I step back in my skin and I put it back on and zip it back up and you are left shiny and clean like a newborn baby, fresh without troubles or anxieties, excited about what's next for you to go into the world and into your life. On the count of three, you will be yourself. One, two, three, be you. Thanks guys.